This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted at the Niles Public Library here in Niles, Illinois on the 22nd of December, a Thursday in the afternoon at now at 3 o'clock in the boardroom in the year 2016. My name is Neil O'Shea. I'm a member of the reference staff here at the Niles Public Library and I'm privileged to be speaking with Mr. Roger Salomon. Mr. Salomon was born on October the 27th in 1926 and now lives in Lincolnwood. I'm going to ask Mr. Salomon, he learned of the Veterans History Project through? My cousin. cousin. And did he participate in the? Yes, he did. He, uh, he, did, he had done it probably a year before he even told me about it. And he asked me just casually if I had been on an honor flight. I said, yeah, I was. And uh, then he said to me, well, uh, I suppose you were, you were in this interview business with uh, your dicks going into the Smithsonian. I said, I don't know a thing about it. So he said, okay, I'll give you a number when I get home, and you call. Hello. <laughs> well, we're very happy that, uh, that you did. No, I'm glad to be here. So, um, may I call you Roger? Absolutely. Uh, so, Roger, uh, do you recall when you entered the service? Yeah. Uh, March 19, 1945. March 19, 1945. And where were you living at that time? I was living in, at the University of Michigan. So you were a student at Ann Arbor? Or? Yeah. Uh, what was your major? I was a pre-med. Pre -med. Had you attended high school in Chicago? No. Oh, yes, yes. I went to Lakeview High School. I went to Ashland and Irving in Chicago. Oh, yeah. 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 What happened was when I graduated in June, and, and uh, my father wanted me to get as much college as I could, so uh, I, I, they, they were having three semesters at that time, three quarters, or three, they actually mm -hmm. can't call them quarters, but there would be, you know, third, third, instead of two, there were three. So I went into the summer uh, portion, and I and I finished uh, <clears throat> almost my first year before they pulled me out. So you were then drafted, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I was. Uh, my home at that time was in Detroit. Uh, reason being, my father was working for a company, and they transferred him to Detroit. So I uh, actually had to change my. So as soon as I graduated from high school, we, I moved, he moved me out to Detroit with my mother, of course. Um, then you found yourself joining the United States Army? Yep. So did you have, did you have opportunity to choose a branch of service? Or? Yes, but that didn't mean anything at that time. It was perfunctory that they would say, and which branch would you like to be in? And you would give them an answer, and they say, fine, you're in the Army. You know, typical the way army works. So, um, and so you were inducted then in Detroit? In Detroit, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I ended up coming to Fort Sheridan anyway. <laughs> so I ended up coming home. So you still had a family home in Chicago? No, but no. I had family. But, but you did have family, yeah. No. yeah. The, um, when you were studying at, at the University of uh, Michigan, did you kind of feel like you had to keep looking over your shoulder because you're going to get drafted yeah. probably pretty oh, sure. soon? Well, yeah. we, all, we were all waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah. That was, that was a normal thing in those days. Yeah. Did a, lot you... of, a lot of the guys were pulling out. Uh, they were, just gave up. We all felt the same way. I mean, what's the point? Let's, we wanted to go in. I mean, you uh, can only imagine how we all felt. If you weren't in service, are we doing okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. No. If you weren't in service, you wanted to be. Mm -hmm. That was the way it was. I mean, the Pearl Harbor and the Bataan and all those things that were occurring at that point. I mean, we felt like slackers. We're walking around in civvies. Why aren't we in anyway? I mean, I suppose I could have enlisted, but I really never thought about it one way or the other. So did you find being in um, basic training or uh, a big change from being in college? Oh, sure. Well, being in the Army is a big change from being in college. 
I mean, your whole life was different. That's the way it worked. So, um, so you you sent to Fort Sheridan, and then you go to a train to a camp somewhere for uh, basic uh, training. We or? trained at. Uh, we did our basic in. Uh, we were sent. I was sent to uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, or Camp Robinson. It's a camp. It's over there. It indicates that it's not permanent. As you know, it has to be a fort. So, the, but that was a what they call an IRTC center, Inf Infantry Replacement Training Center. And that's I stayed there after my basic because I could read and write. So there were nine of us who were kept out. We thought we were in trouble. They don't tell you anything. The unit shipped out, and the nine of us are sitting there. And for two weeks we sat there. And then they finally came and told us that we were going to be part of the cadre, as it's referred to. Or training sergeant, as they call them now. It was a good break. I mean, I, I was in a place where I wasn't going to get killed. Although I wanted to go with the group. I felt like a pariah. So you, you were chosen to participate in this training group? As a trainer. As a trainer? Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. did you get a promotion as a result mm -hmm. of that? I ended up a corporal. I should have had sergeant stripes, but the war was takes time, and the war was pretty well, and I didn't want to fill up the, uh, the table. So you got your, your corporal stripes or whatever in, in Arkansas? Yeah. I should have, as I said, I should have had sergeant. It was supposed to come down any day, but Harry dropped the bomb, and then it wasn't there anymore. So I didn't need it at that time. I did, uh, I did have other plans, though, at the time. I got very friendly with a couple of, I worked with a couple of officers who were happy with the fact that I could read and write so that I did a lot of things for them that they didn't have to do for themselves. Of course, that was my job. So one of them said, uh, I can arrange it for you to get an interview to go to OCS. Would you like that? I said, yeah, I would. You'll stay in a while? I said, yeah, sure. Then I didn't realize it when I called home and I told my mother what I wanted to do. That was the end of that conversation. <laughs> but looking back at it now, it might not have been a bad idea. Well, you wouldn't have been able to, would I you have been able to be an to officer and be a doctor also? No. no. As it was, I by the time I got through with four years of college and two years of the Army, I had it. I just got my degree and then... Uh, so when you were... Um, Training the young people, were they? They were old people too. Old people too. Guys like 35. Were they hard to train or everybody's different or? Well, but it was hard for me. Because you're speaking to somebody. Well, I'm talking to somebody who's 10 years older than I am. Or maybe more. And were you training them in anything in particular or all aspects of? Oh, uh, well, we had, we had a training schedule. Every week it was posted and uh, it was a regular, like they do in school. Did you enjoy one uh, section of training as opposed to others? No. no. It's hard work. It's very hard work. Um, I might, if I can digress here for a moment, I was interviewing one veteran and um, I was inquiring about where he went to high school because for somebody like m myself in the far distant peanut gallery trying to appreciate it, I always think that the veterans must have had good high school education, a good high school education. Not like, necessarily. That's what he said. He said the reason why they were good is because he was a training sergeant. He said, we train those guys. And he took great pride in that, Mr. Horseman. Well, you know, there are people you got in there, and you, the only way they could know their left from their right when you put a rock in their hand. And I'm not kidding. And it was the first time in my life that I had ever run into people who couldn't read. I, that was a revelation as far as I was concerned. I didn't know anybody who didn't know how to read. Every, I thought everybody in the world knew how to read. Yeah. Not so. And the fact that a, a person couldn't read or write, it didn't mean they couldn't be a helpful soldier. Oh, they soldier. can still be. They, yeah, can still they just can't read a trading manual, and they wouldn't be in a position to to uh, do anything in the way of, uh, let's say, like uh, if 
you know, then we'll, you know, give a course or something like that. Couldn't. Yeah. Would there have been a large percentage that couldn't read and write? I couldn't, I can't give you percentages, yeah. but I ran into a lot of guys. A lot of guys, yeah. yeah. I suppose it was a small percentage, but we had them in the army. I mean, don't forget, the infantry got everybody. Yeah. You didn't have to be special to go in the infantry. So do you think the reason you were signaled out for this is because of an IQ test, or? No, because the fact that, uh, that uh, they may, uh, I, I joined into a lot of things. I, I did things and, uh, when I, and during my basic training. And uh, I reacted to things that a lot of the fellows mm -hmm. don't have the same background couldn't react to. So, you know, you've, when you watch a group, there's always one or two that just by accident are outstanding, not outstanding, but different better. And also there's one in every group who absolutely doesn't have any clue as to what's going on. So your time in the service then, most of it was at Camp Robinson in the, in the training? Uh, most of it, yeah. Until the war was over. Yeah. Was, was there a big city near there that you're a... Yeah, for Little Rock. Little Rock, so... Not a big city, but uh, a city. Arkansas it's standards, nice. yeah. So you had a if you got a break from camp or a pass? Oh, yeah, sure. We'd go in. There's, there were buses. And we'd go in on I mean, furloughs, I went home. But on weekends, when I, if I was off, or even at night sometimes, although I, most of the time I stayed, during the week I stayed in camp. Yeah. So when you say that your unit division was IRTC, that was the Infantry Replacement Training, Training Center, Center at Camp Camp Robinson. Because right. they might uh, the other camps might already might also have the same yes. cadre or whatever. Yeah, yeah. exactly the same. So you said you, you would have made sergeant, but it was because the war ended, you think? Or Yeah. 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 No, I was slighted for it. I was I had already sent in the papers. But I uh, but then what happened was uh, B E Day. And everything stopped in the camp. I mean, it was like somebody pulled the curtain down, and you couldn't do anything. There was nothing to do. We weren't training anymore for Europe, so we had a new program that we had to be developed. So rather than develop programs for fighting in the Jap home islands. They decided to gather up all the trainers, all the whole camp, all of us, and a lot of the ancillary people who were around, and they were going to send it. We're going, we're going over. They figured we're trained, we can do the job better. We're part of the half a million that we're going to send over. Okay. And we were sitting in the stands. And this is after a couple of weeks, or maybe a month of not doing. No, about a couple of weeks of sitting around not doing anything. And uh, we, we had an area where it was, it was like an amphitheater, you know, crude but amphitheater. And uh, it was an early morning, and this uh, poor colonel, bird colonel, walked up and he said, Men, listen up. He said, Look to your left, look to your right. And one in three of you isn't coming back. Just what he said. And then, the way it was. It was interesting. It was a thought. And so he said, uh, we're going to prepare for our push. They had to do it, they feel. They were running out of men. In 1946, they were running out of men. I mean, they're taking men who were I was telling my, uh, my somebody this morning, they were taking men with, who were at one C, like you had a family. We're taking the guys like this. So, you know, there's, it's not a bottomless pit. It's a point when you don't have any more people. So they were going to use us because that was that was a sensible way to go. They weren't going to spend another 17 weeks trading a bunch of people who were still green after they were trained. So it made sense. 
So if the war in the Pacific hadn't ended, you would have headed oh, we were on the Operation way. Cornet or whatever. Yeah, yeah. We, we were on the way. And then you would have been in, in combat. Oh, sure. It? No more training. Yeah. No more training. I wouldn't do anything. I was going to just, that's it. Yeah. So, um, so VE Day is in early May, I think, right? 45, and then the bomb is dropped uh, August 6th or 7th. Yeah. 46. Yeah. So you were, I imagine the, all the, it was great relief then when the, <laughs> To say the least. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a funny thing. Young people, at least in my experience, don't look at death the way <laughs> older people look at death. There's a different approach to it. I'm well, now I'm 90 years old. I mean, I'm more or less to the point where I know that we're losing guys, 700 guys, 600 guys a day. So I'm resigned to the fact it's going to be my turn, you know, but not when you're 19. Yeah. yeah. A whole different book. Yeah. So, um, so you're a trainer, teacher, whatever, instructor yeah. down in, in Camp yeah. Robinson, and you're, you're able, you're, is there anything about that way of life that you really disliked or? No, a lot of it. A lot of it. Yeah, but, uh, you know, you put up with it because it's part of the program, at least it was for me. Yeah. Right? What could I do? Yeah. I was fortunate. I had a, a good job, and uh, and uh, I got along with all of the officers. And he, and I was an NCO myself, so that, I had no problems. Yeah, that wasn't the first time you were away from home. No, or, no. no. So um, away at home for college. Yeah, and uh, and it wasn't the first time you met lots of different people from different parts of the country. No, it no. Was, that was the first time. Oh, exposure to these. And especially the folks that were so yeah, good reading and writing. Yeah, uh, for people from all of them, could be anywhere. Yeah. Was it uh, easy to stay in touch with your family? Yeah, sure. Yeah, because you... Letters. Yeah. Phones weren't too popular. It was hard to get to a phone. And, uh, but we had letters, and uh, I, got a, I got a couple of furloughs during the course of my... so I could get home. And was that all? We got to Chicago, or Detroit, or depended, or well, depending upon where, where somebody going. was. Yeah. yeah, mostly it was Detroit. My mother had got was hired by when when we moved. She was sharp, and they hired her to work the ration board, the main ration board downtown in uh, Detroit. So uh, she had a good job during the war too. I mean, when I say good job, I'm not talking money wise. I'm talking the fact that able to, to uh, lend a hand, so to speak. Did, did you say there were nine of you that came from, no, there were nine kept back for the training contract? I think there were nine. Yeah. yeah. Anybody that you joined up with from Michigan that you? Yeah. Yeah. One of my buddies had to be a, 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 good, a good deal, a fluke, and he was kept too. So you had a friend there then? Yeah, so yeah. we, uh, yeah. you know, we could lean on each other. I mean, it, it, it isn't that you need anything special. It's just, uh, it's, it's uh, comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. The unknown is always a little harder to cope with than something that's, you know. Yeah. Um, so any of the men that you trained Did they go to Europe, or they were still sort of in this? I'm not sure. Build, not sure, building it up, yeah. Um, I couldn't answer that, yeah. but I don't know. Uh, I have to assume, now, at one point, you can go back during my training, they were talking about sending us to the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah. But then they, they couldn't find enough ways to get us there, so we never made it. It looked like we were going to go, but that was in about a 14th week. Basic training, normal basic training was 17 weeks. If there was a problem and they needed men sooner, they would they could lop it off at 14 weeks. Nothing less than that, though. They, you couldn't send anybody out less than that. You couldn't be trained. You, well, uh, I mean, there were things that you just had to learn, the bayonet tactics and handling different weapons and 
you know, in the infantry, you, you've got mortars, you've got uh, machine guns, you've got uh, rifles, you've got carbines, you've got, you've got hand guns. I mean, there's a lot there. Um, I noticed on the biographical data form that you also spent, uh, you demonstrated the use of this snooper scope. Yeah, that was, uh, they called it then, that there was actually the infrared now, but they have glasses for that. But what they did is a canister they mounted on top of a carbine, and I wore a battery pack. <clears throat> and it worked the same way that your night vision goggles work. But now it's in goggles instead of this big heavy thing. And so I went all over the camp because, uh, and showed how they, they would uh, sneak around their people in, in areas when they were watching. And, uh, and then I would say, oh, he's over there. Oh, he's moving, you know, kind of. Yeah. Nobody got a chance to use it, but they could see that it worked. Yeah. I wonder who manufactured that. Um, yeah, the snooper scope, infrared at night. Yeah, and then you also um, you were awarded an expert infantryman. Yes, that badge. was an additional thing. You had to go to uh, after I became a cadetman. Uh, I was talking to the uh, captain one day, and uh, he said to me, "In fact, I'm wearing it. It's on my. It's on my." Yes, there it is, right there. That is similar to the combat infantry, mm -hmm. except without the wreath. And it paid five bucks a month. But we had to go through a course. And, it, and uh, you know, go, now I don't mean, I mean physically go through a course. It yeah. was a bugger. And uh, quite a, quite a, it's, it's funny, all of, he made all the, he wanted all the non-coms to go through it. I think only three of us made it. And that would have been an M? M1. M1. Yeah. It wasn't anything to do with shooting. You just had your rifle with you. This was crawling over, crawling up. You've seen these guys going up rope ladders, you know, uh, ladders made of rope and uh, over with a big, I wore a 30 pound pack. Yeah. I mean, all kinds of You've things. always been fairly fit. I was, I was fairly athletic, yeah. yeah. So, and I enjoyed that. I mean, I, and I, and I wanted that bad. I didn't have any medals. At least I had a badge. <laughs> and then, and then the badge. You, did you were qualify for that uh, before you were in the cadre, or while you were in the cadre? Train. Oh no, I was I was a cadreman by then. So you then then you got this additional course. Qual yeah. So then, um, were there any particularly uh, humorous or unusual events that you recall that happening in camp? Or? Good question, I guess. Uh, humorous? You know, screw ups, you mean? <laughs> uh, no, I can't. I don't offhand can't yeah. think of anything. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't anything to laugh at there, really. I mean, it was serious. And um, I noticed that you also were at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Okay, then after training has ceased, they don't need the IRTC anymore, okay? It's over. So they would get, they got to the point where they were going to start closing it out. Wow. So uh, move all the personnel out and take all the equipment out. And now it's just, I don't know what it is now, I haven't been back in Little Rock in a long time, but. I assume it's either a housing project or it's an empty lot. I don't know. But uh, so I was taking, you know, I had time on my hands. So I took a USAFI course, United States Armed, United States Armed Forces Institute, USAFI, which means I was going to go and get some college credit. And what I thought I needed was, are you okay? Mm -hmm. What I thought I needed was typing. I figured that was the best thing I could do for myself. So I took a typing, I started to take a typing course. And I had time to go and do it. I made arrangements on it. 
And uh, I learned how to be a pretty good typist at that time. So one day we're sitting after we had been after I was in Fort Knox already. No, it was we were transferred out. I was transferred to a uh, uh, what's that? I won't give you the exact names of these things. <laughs> I'm digging deep here. Uh, tank destroyers. They're the ones that uh, you know picked up the the, um, the <coughs> T tanks that were uh, to be rehabilitated, rehabilitated. So anyway, the first sergeant said to me, uh, not said to you, he says, any of you guys know how to type? So I raised my hand. I said, yeah, I can type. He says, okay, they went, you need somebody down at the motor pool, so grab your stuff and take a walk down there and report to the uh, I think he was a oh, warrant officer. Went to the warrant officer. So I ran, I went down and uh, reported. And uh, he said, Can you type? I said, Yeah, I can type. I said, I'm not 90 words a minute, but I said, I can type it. All right. He said, Your job is to make sure that all the vehicles get serviced properly and so on. I said, That's easy. No trick. You, know, you had file cabinets and you knew what you had. And it needed to be greased or oiled or tires or whatever. And that's what I did till I was separated. So I. So in that over a year after the, from the end of the Japanese surrender, um, no, I you're in Fort that. Knox, Kentucky. Uh, probably more about eight months. About eight months in Fort Knox, Kentucky. Yeah. And then that's where you were separated. separated. I was separated in Fort Knox and I was sent home. Did um, did you find it? You didn't find it difficult to re reacquaint yourself or adjust to civilian yeah, life. I, I I had a few minor minor problems. Uh, I had a backache that bothered me, but it went away. Now, as a result of labors yeah, in the I army, yeah, it was a different set, different life. You know, totally different. Well, you must have been overall. You were happy. To be. I wasn't unhappy. Yeah. I don't say I was happy with the army. Although it wasn't no, I mean, I mean to, to return to civilian life. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, I'm not going to take this. I just I'll turn it around. That sounds good. That's good. Sounds like the Legacy Girls. Boogie yeah. Woogie Boy. That's Lynn Miller! You know, you guys. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, oh. and, and then the fact that, so you were, um, you were thinking about going back to school then? Oh, I was definitely going back. You didn't have to worry about getting a job or? No. No. no you no. had a? No. Yeah. No, were you I able had... to use the GI Bill? Yeah. At the University of Michigan? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was a funny story, which I'll tell you in a minute. But uh, no, my plan was if I couldn't go to say any, I was not going to say any army, I was going back to school. So it was. But I got home and I had a backache. Bothered. It wasn't real serious, but that was my little problem. But it went away. And uh, my folks are good people, and uh, only I'm an only child. So they uh, didn't coddle me, but uh, they were they were very helpful. So, you know. So the, and then the GI Bill was 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 helpful. Yeah, yeah. The GI Bill. Oh, that was a that was a wonderful thing. And then you had the 5220 Club. Did anybody ever tell you about the 5220 Club? I don't think so. 5220 Club was, was, it was, when they call it a club, it was it really wasn't a club. But they, if you didn't go back to school, then the government gave you $20 a week for 52 weeks. Can I tell you something new, Neil? You sure did. <laughs> and I've, I've spoken to a lot of vets, you know. Yeah, 50, well, if they didn't go back to school yeah. and they were trying to get a job or didn't mm -hmm. want to get a job or couldn't get a job, they had the 5220 Club. And as we call it a club. Crazy, huh? But you didn't. No. Because you were in school. No, no yeah. I was in school. Yeah. 
No, I went right back to school. And you were just as good a student when you got back as you were beforehand? And yeah. No yeah. change. I wasn't much. That didn't affect me too much. Yeah. Just, the only thing that bothered me was the fact that I knew I wasn't going to go any further. Yeah. I just had it. So when you had indicated the, in, the possible interest in going to officer's training school? Right? That was before I got out. Before you got out. And was that, that was still in, in uh, no. Arkansas, was it? Well, it wouldn't have been in Arkansas so was anyway. It would have been in Kentucky? Were you? No, it could have been there. It could have been, well, no, the, I think the officer training that they had was not in, in uh, it might have been in Fort Knox. I don't recall. Yeah. But by the time you decided to leave the army, that yeah. idea. Well, I could have, I could have gone to uh, ROTC mm -hmm. if I wanted to. Yeah, and gotten my commission that way had but, I wanted to. But, but I'm glad I didn't because I'd have gotten, i gotten pulled to be at for for uh, uh, the uh, first war we had, which is Korea. Yeah, I definitely would have been in that because I, you know. <laughs> So I guess I did myself a good turn by not doing that. Yeah. In fact, I during the uh, that particular uh, situation, I had uh, I, I had thought that I might be recalled because my MOS was uh, infantry. I couldn't get. I tried to get a different MOS when I got separated. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I figure if I have to go back, I'd like to go back as something besides a ditch digger, you know. But, yeah. Uh, did you um, did you make any buddies during the service that you stayed in touch with? No. Not too much. I made a lot of buddies. A couple of them we saw subsequently. Or one of one of the boys came through uh, well after I got out and stayed at our home and uh, and uh, we spent a couple of weeks with him, but. No, that, that that all dissipated. So you did you um, did you join a veterans organization or anything like that? Or I don't belong to any veterans organization. Yeah. I give money to it. I know the I get mail from the American Legion, which I don't yeah. care about. But there are other organizations mm -hmm. that do nice veterans. But I mean, I I, I support them, but I don't. I did become a, a Mason. I took my Masonic degrees, and then it ended up a thirty-second. That's a really high, isn't it? Thirty-second. It's not quite as high as you can go, but you have to be very active to go to the thirty-third. Yeah. yeah. The um, I, I sense we're coming to the uh, the end of the interview. Um, well, my uh, did, you know, so my army stuff wasn't that exciting. You know, yeah. So. I didn't do it. I mean, I, I did what I had, what I was told to do, but I don't necessarily feel that I uh, accomplished a hell of a lot. I don't know. I did. Well, I, somebody took, I took somebody's place and they went off and <laughs> to fight, I guess. Yeah, but you you were there when uh, your country called and you did, you, you did what was I asked did of what you, they asked and, you me did, to do. and you distinguished yourself. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, there's always two questions that we pose to, the, to oh. the veteran toward the end of the interview, and that is, uh, how do you think your military service and experiences affected your life? I think it's more important now than it was when I first got out. I've, I've been very, very lucky to uh, be involved with things that were, because that I'm a World War II veteran, you know, we we weren't the greatest generation when we all got out. Although we, they didn't spit on us, that, that was nothing like that. But there's a lot of little, a lot of little uh, pluses that happen. That uh, especially when people know that you're a World War II vet. Um, your experience in the military did it influence, or has it influenced your thinking about war? Well, one thing I know that wars are fought by young people, not for old men. And of course, to advocate war would be, I should get a shrink. 
if that would, if that were, if I were to say the oil war is great, I mean, well, I mean, I, I can't. I know people are. They don't care. They love war. They're not. It's it's not fun. It's not fun at all. It's a very serious situation, and, and it's deadly. <laughs> you know. And you have a, a a positive opinion about the military in general. Well, that's, you know, when you're there, it's, there's always there are always things that happen that the that typical army. Hurry up and wait was one of them, for example. And uh, there's a lot there's a lot that could be you know, especially if you get involved with an officer who's really a, just mm -hmm. you can't you know you can't. Reason with him, he, you know, he's got an idea about something, and then you're stuck with it. And you can't sass him back, and you can't tell him no. So the military has its faults, but uh, I think we have a pretty good army, got good equipment, good training. And we certainly can hold our own against anybody. I don't love the army, but I sure don't hate it. Yeah. Did you? Um, I'm just thinking back in here. You didn't pick up any bad habits like gambling or smoking when you were in the army. Oh, well, everybody smoked in those days. Everybody smoked. You, know. mm -hmm. you watch the movies from the '40s. Mm -hmm. Even baseball players, athletes, mm -hmm. everybody smoked. See a movie? Everybody smoked. Yeah, I started. I was. I smoked in the service. Had you smoked before you went into the service? Yeah. Okay. But minor. Minor. Yeah. And cigarettes were cheap. During the war, you couldn't get them. Yeah. So as a, I think you use the term NCO. You were an NCO. Yeah. So did you have any like privileges for 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 good beer or club or anything like that on 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 I'm not base? A beer I'm not a beer drinker. I never cared for beer. Yeah. Here I've gone to college and. Oh, long of attorney. <laughs> hey, we <were, laughs> used to go on Friday, you know, TGIF. Yeah. You know, yeah. let's have beers. I've been on a couple of those. <laughs> My daughter, same thing, went to school four years. She can't stand beer. <laughs> uh, you know, we, uh, you know, being an NCO is better than being a private. I mean, I, I'm not saying that you get a lot of things in your favor, but there are a few. And, uh, you know, like any anything else, you take advantage of these things. If they're there, you do it. You know. Were there any um, famous entertainers that came through the camp? No. No. Yeah, yeah. nothing there. Nothing there. No, no there was a. Uh, it was strictly what it was, was an IRTC, that's yeah. it. and that's all there was there. So you would, you might meet individuals for 17 weeks? And, go, and they're gone. And then they're gone. Yeah. And they, oh, not might, you would. They were gone, gone. and then you'd... Or you could be that in that 17 weeks, and you are gone. Yeah. You know, that was a... They, so does anybody you. flunk basic training? I'm sorry? Does anybody wash out of basic training or get flunked or something? Yeah. yeah. There are, uh, I talked about that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they sent him home. He just couldn't, you know, he just couldn't uh, measure up at all. But uh, if they, they you could, if they're just partially not with it, then they, they get punished and they get with it. That's it. You know, they give them extra duty, like. KP or latrine duty, stuff like that. You know, I had a, I had a, had a guy that was uh, was a real smart one. He thought, and so he gave me a lot of sass one day in front of a lot of people. So it came the weekend, he found out he was on KP. And I wanted to know why he was on KP, and he was told that I did it. So he came looking for me. I said, next time, watch your mouth. You're not going to make me look like a fool in front of all these guys. I put up with, with you, and I'm going to hear it from them. I said, I might as well get out of here. I said, it's not, my job's over. It's 
that uh, just watch your mind. There you go. You know, you can't have them flunk things in front of you, in front of that, not in front of me, but in front of everybody else. Yeah. It just yeah. doesn't work. Yeah. Is there anything that you'd like to add that we have not covered in the interview? Uh, I'm just trying to think if there was anything that, as I'd say, it wasn't really exciting. I worked hard. I worked hard. To, I worked with the training manuals. Every one of the steps in the 17 week program had a training manual. And it was exactly what they call SOP, Standard Operating Procedure, and that's how you did it. And uh, one of the reasons probably why he kept me was because I used to come in every week before the following week and ask for a training manual so I could see what the hell we're going to get into. I didn't want to be surprised and look like a jerk. Forearmed as, forewarned as forearmed, you know. The and the army food was okay. You didn't lose a lot of weight in there or anything. No. I ate whatever they gave me. We were hungry. I worked hard. Uh, the only thing that changed when I, I came from an environment of uh, as a milk drinker, and if I wanted to eat my cereal, I hadn't had any milk to drink. So I, that was when I first started drinking coffee. That was my first experience with coffee. And did you stay with coffee then when you? Oh, well, now I drink yeah, coffee. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I didn't then. I'd never tasted coffee until I got in service. My mother didn't believe that coffee for, for a child was what he, they should have. But the army felt different, you know. I just wasn't, an, I, when I asked for more milk, they laughed at me. Get out of here, you. <laughs> I don't know if it's different now, I don't. You know, the, the old adage about know the right people didn't change in the army. There were two people that you had to know to get along without any problem. The first one was a mess sergeant, the second one was the supply sergeant. If those two guys were on your team or you were on their team, you had no problems. They could solve everything. That's what it was. Do you remember their names? No. no. And it's, uh, it's a game, you know. Watch again. But uh, I, if I had it to do over again, I would go again. Not now, I mean, but you know. But, uh, and there wasn't any uh, chance or of your being called up for Korea. Oh, not Korea. No. It would have been. It, it, uh, it, You'd already. Yeah. Yeah. No, there was a chance. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Korea. Yeah. I was thinking further on. Yeah, there was there was a there was a good chance, and I was a little concerned about it. But as it as it panned out, it, it never happened. And did you con continue with your medical your pre medical studies? I I continued with it, and I got my degree, and I have a B.S. in zoology. But uh, I just didn't want any more school. I know that to be a doctor, and I have a son-in-law who's a doctor. Mm -hmm. He and my daughter got married after he got out of medical school. But he still had a long road to go before he was really doing what he should be doing, could be doing. So I'm not unhappy about that. It would have been nice. But had I had my buttons, I would have, I would have, now that I look back, you know, it's always, hindsight is always 2020. I would have gone and been an uh, optician or something. You know, or a couple of years of study. I had the basics, so I only needed a couple more years to, yeah. to be in a, to be something in that nature. You know, to, yeah, especially eyes. So I never thought of it. So but it um, your eventual career choice wasn't affected by your army experience. Oh, I guess it was. Yeah, I went to work for my father. It seemed like the right thing to do, and it was the wrong thing to do. Don't work for a relative. Even though I'm an only child, it just was not. I mean, he was set in his ways, and I was young, and you know, we had different ideas about things. 
can't uh, as I say each and all dog my trick. Yeah. It's, I was just thinking your, you, your, your aptitude and abilities as a teacher or a trainer, I was thinking maybe that would have, you would have... I never had a, I never had a calling to go to yeah. be a teacher. Mm -hmm. Although I, uh, now that's funny you should say because I've become a, uh, an instructor for the ARP safe driving. Mm -hmm. I've been doing that for about, I wanted to do something, something constructive. I didn't stop working until I was 85. And I was at a loss after I stopped. You still don't look 85, by the way. I'm so, 90. I know, but. <laughs> just want to write a few notes in case, yeah, I, fine. Missed, in case I missed it, time. in case it stopped there. You find this interesting? Fascinating. Yeah, I'm sure everybody's got a different approach yeah. to it. I feel like I was raised on, uh, on World War II, you know. My, uh, yeah. Probably there's a, quite a series on. Uh, public radio about World War II. Yeah. I just got through watching it. So brings back some memories, you know. But uh So did your um your wife then, did she ever see you in uniform or No. No. Yeah. I have my uniform. I don't I can't fit into it anymore. I have a thirty inch waist down, now I have thirty four. I'm not too bad from where I was. But, uh, well, Roger, I want to thank you for I want to thank coming you in today for the interview. I've been generous uh, with the going details. Over this, uh, yeah. You know, it brings back a lot of memories. And, uh, I'm just trying to make sure that there wasn't anything else I wanted to tell well, you. Well, if, if you think of anything, uh, we can add it. Okay. Uh, because sometimes uh, gentlemen will go home and they'll talk to their family, and a daughter will say, Dad, did you tell them the time about that? And then, then they. It's okay. We can we we get it in there, you know. Yeah. Well, as I say, my wasn't terribly exciting. My uh, it was a it was a day to day job basically. Teaching a guy how to protect himself and do the juicy equipment he had to try to save his life. You know, some guys just didn't want to listen, and some guys couldn't listen, and then there were other people who could. Thank you, Roger. Okay. Thank you, Neil. So, a World War II veteran, and uh, he, his wife didn't want him to go. You can't fight that. I don't. I brought it up once, and I saw her stiffen. I knew right away that. Not right. It's not what I ought to do. <laughs> Bye, Ben.